Hi, I'm Chris Faulkner with the Prince Mohammed bin Fahd Center. I'm here with Dr. Patricia Avery, full professor at the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome. And Thank we're going to have a few questions uh, mm -hmm. about tolerance and education. Um, so first off, I'd like you to introduce yourself, um, a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure. My name is Pat Avery, and I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And I have been there for 29 years now. I, I teach social studies education and I primarily work with secondary social studies teachers. So these are people who are planning to become, say, your high school, middle school, history, civics, econ, or government um, uh, geography teachers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank yeah. you. Um, so I know you worked on a project with the secondary education teachers on structured academic controversy. Do you maybe talk yes. a little bit about what structured academic controversy is, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. what lessons you learned from that study? Sure. That was a project with the Con Constitutional Rights Foundation Chicago and Los Angeles and then Street Law. And I was the evaluator for the project. It, um, from 2004 to 2012, I believe, we worked in various sites throughout the United States, but also with 13 other countries, um, primarily Eastern Europe and Latin America, several countries in Latin America. The teachers, all of whom were secondary teachers, were trained to use a model of deliberation that we call Structured Academic Controversy, or SAC for short. The Structured Academic Controversy is a method for deliberating controversial issues. And it is structured. Um, it was developed by the Johnson Brothers at the University of Minnesota. Well, back in the, the 70s at some point. And there's a fair amount of research on it that shows it to be a, a um, good means of increasing students' academic achievement, their tolerance levels, their um, self-esteem, their, um, let's see, perspective-taking abilities and um, uh, motivation for learning. What it is, is the uh, starts out with a, a controversy, a uh, controversial public issue. For example, should, um, oh, should we have compulsory voting in the United States or you know, in, in whatever country you're, you're living in? And the students would all read uh, material that would give them both pro and con arguments for that. They would be divided up into groups of four, whereby two of the students take the pro position and two of the students take the con position. They have some time to gather their thoughts, and then they are given um, a specified amount of time to share their arguments or, um, uh, yes, share their arguments with the other two people in their group, during which time the other two people are not to um, ask any questions. They're just to, supposed to listen. So it's, it's to teach them to listen as opposed to constantly thinking of how you're going to um, uh, argue against something. Then they have a chance to ask some clarifying questions and then the opposing side would share their arguments. Um, let's say they're the con arguments. They'll share their arguments with the other two. What happens then is what I think makes this um, uh, an important methodology, and that is that the two sides switch positions so that the people who were taking the pro side are now taking the con side. 
and putting you in that position of arguing both sides. At that point, you go through the whole process again and you're to you know, present the arguments for or against and add to what went on in the, in the first round. Then students drop their positions. They are to deliberate the question, much as a, a jury deliberates, and weighs the evidence, pro and con. Uh, quite often students will come up with a, a third alternative, a little bit from both the pro and the con arguments, or, or a whole different um, idea of how to, to address the, the problem. Um, say with the compulsory voting issue, the problem is really um, underlying it is a, a low percentage of, of voters coming to the ballot box on election day. So they may think of ways to boost voting without making um, voting controversial. Then the um, students will, uh, they come up with the best consensus position that they can come up with and they share that with the entire class. You think about what were your, your best arguments for, what were your best arguments against, and um, try to uh, share, well, you share your ideas within the context of the whole classroom. One of the reasons that it's, it's a powerful methodology is that it puts the students in in um, different roles and they have to take the uh, perspective, often a perspective that they don't agree with, um, but they, they start to see the arguments both for and, and against. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds really mm -hmm. interesting. Um, I think it blends, blends nicely in with uh, this mm -hmm. idea of political tolerance, which I know mm -hmm. you've spoken a lot about in a, a previous mm -hmm. event. Um, could you maybe define mm -hmm. what political tolerance is mm -hmm. um, and maybe talk a little bit about how instructors mm -hmm. should promote political tolerance in a classroom mm -hmm. setting? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, political tolerance is the willingness to extend civil liberties or support civil, civil liberties for those groups um, that one disagrees with, okay? Or to put up with ideas that you find um, objectionable. So let's say you take the concept of freedom of expression. Everybody's for freedom of expression. Uh, adults, children, youth, everybody thinks freedom of expression is great. But then you ask them about a group that they disagree with, and everybody has a group that, that um, arouses some kind of an emotional trigger that um, they, they disagree with. For example, um, Nazis, the KKK, uh, for people um, uh, can be any kind of group. Um, for some it might be the GLBTQ, Black Lives Matter, um, feminist, pro, um, abortion, anti-abortion, whatever, but you can, everybody has some group that um, th their views they find very objectionable. So then you ask about whether they would allow f um, that group to say, uh, have, a, have a rally in their city. And that's when you start to see a disparity between support for the abstract principles of democracy and concrete examples. So one way to promote tolerance in the classroom, first of all, recognize that conflict is not always ne a negative. Conflict can be a real positive too. In terms of, of promoting tolerance, we want to make sure that we give students um, concrete examples so that they're, they're constantly seeing how abstract principles are applied to specific situations. We try to help them understand how tolerance is a very important part of democracy. 
if you think about the marketplace of ideas, uh, we, we value that marketplace of ideas because we want to have a range of options to choose from and we can ferret out the bad ideas. Our, good, our own ideas may become better by having to explain them to a group. Um, so I also think that once you start silencing groups, you're, you could be on a slippery slope. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's all the questions I have for now. Okay. Um, I appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for coming. All right. Thanks very much. Okay.